coming back soon. Amen. Amen. And that's the truth. What season is it? Amen. Resurrection. It's a resurrection time. Anyway, I am so filled with the Spirit. I had a hard time trying to choke back tears, you know, and God said a long time ago, he says, if you're a person that's lived any length of time in this earth, you've gone through a certain amount of sufferings, certain amount of hardships, and look at how far God has brought you. And there's so much to be thankful for, so much to really, to love him for. Amen. And you know, I love God because he first loved me. For God, who can quote it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now who can go with me on verse 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Amen. So here's the, here's the deceiver. The deceiver wants your eyes on everything else but Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is the focal point of the Father. Jesus said to Philip, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, I do everything he says, everything he does, what he's told me to do, I fulfill everything. And today, hallelujah, I'm excited. We get to share how Jesus, on the way from the 10th, all the way to the 16th, just the day before he rose from the dead, we're going to share what events that he had to cover. Did you know the scripture says that Jesus had to come? And he said to John, it must be that I fulfill all that is written of me or all righteousness. Amen. And so we're going to cover that today. was the word and the word was God. with God and the word was God. so that means when you speak the word you're speaking who God. that's why when we pray we don't pray from our reasoning we pray from the word so that God just moves everything out of the way how many know Satan can't fight Jesus how many know Satan can't fight God and if the word is God, then he can't fight the word too, right? Everyone say, I'm a wordy. I'm a wordy. Breakfast of champions. <laughs> Amen. All right. All of our thoughts that war against God's word or God's thoughts. Can you say amen? amen? So we want to line our life up with the word of God. Everyone say, line your life up with the word of God. Now smile at the person next to you and I says, I'm going to see that you do. <laughs> amen. Okay. So let me just kind of set you up for what we're going to do and then we'll read our scripture back there. First of all, God is really very accurate in everything he does in scripture. So what you need to realize is that everything that Jesus did when he came and he walked as a man, he fulfilled every jot and tittle of the demands of the law. The law says no man can go to heaven unless he is absolutely perfectly good. How many here know we can't do that? So the law points us to someone that can do that in us and for us. What's his name? Amen. The law points us as a schoolmaster to the one that saves us. His name is Jesus. So he fulfilled every jot, every tittle, every little piece of the law so that it could say on the cross, it is finished. If it's finished, then it's what? I said, if it's finished, then it's then why are you still fighting so hard and trying to maintain such a life? Because the deceiver wants you to think that you don't have a finished product. You have one you have to complete. No. Did Jesus save you to the utmost? Did Jesus die rosy? Did he leave anything out about your protection, about your redemption? Did he? Did he leave you for the wolves? No, he left you in the planet so you could put the devil under defeat. Do you left one? 
and the right one. Amen. All right. So I know I get a little intense or loud when I get all preachy, but it's not me yelling at you, okay? Go with me to, to Genesis, uh, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 12, and let's read our Bible here. All right. This is Hebrews chapter 10. Does anybody here have a hard time with the book of Hebrews? If you, if, if you do, it's really not hard. You just got to know the theme. The theme of the whole book of Hebrews is Jesus is better than everything of the law. Better than the angels, better than the priesthood, better than the temple, better than the, you know, all of these things because Jesus, who is our Savior? Jesus. So listen to what he says about the old covenant. In chapter 10, verse 8 says, previously is saying, this is talking about Jesus now, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, let's talk about the Father, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them. So was God really pleased with all the animal sacrifices? No, because it really didn't remove sin in your heart. It only covered it. I don't know about you, you know, is somebody going to cover my bill? That's okay. But you see, Jesus removed our sin. Hello? How much sin did he remove? Past, present, and? and? That's what's really hard for people to figure out. God has made you a child of God now, so you no longer a sinner saved by grace. So it says, no pleasure in them, which are offered to the law. But when he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. This is Jesus speaking, okay? He takes away the first, and that he may establish the second. He takes away the first what? Come on, study here. The first covenant. Now listen, the old covenant is glorious, it's wonderful, but it's fulfilled. It has some flaws in it. Did you know that? Well, there are a couple of things that the Old Testament couldn't do. Well, number one, it couldn't remove your sin, only covered it. It couldn't save you. You couldn't get born again in the Old Testament. You only got saved by faith in the future death and resurrection of Jesus. Are you with me? So, listen. Behold, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first covenant and establishes the second. By that we will have been sanctified or set apart through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for. So Jesus became our sacrifice, didn't he? In the Old Testament, what would happen? You guys just listen to me carefully. In the Old Testament, they would have a high priest, and the high priest would have to sacrifice for himself and his family so he could go in and sacrifice for the whole nation. Everyone say, I got that. I'm trying to keep everything simple, okay? So the high priest would go in. So he's got to sacrifice a sacrifice for his family and himself, and if it's accepted, then he can go into the holies of holies, and he can do the lamb sacrifice and the scapegoat in the presence of God for the whole nation. Now, God every year had to have the high priest do that. So that was a reminder of their sinfulness every year. But Jesus came as the last sacrifice. He's going to fulfill every sacrifice in the temple. He's going to be the sacrifice of the lamb. He's going to be the scapegoat. And he's going to take care of all of our sins, sicknesses, and pay the full price of our penalty. Can you say amen? And he redeemed us, or he purchased us, he bought us with his own blood. All right, so take your Bible and go with me to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at the preparation of the lamb. You guys remember the Passover? Now, I hope I'm not going over your head, because the Passover is the first feast where, remember, the death angel passed over the firstborn of the Israelites because they put what on the doorpost? blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Now, folks, everyone say doorpost. Okay, so when they put the blood on the doorpost, they put it on the top, the bottom, the side, the side. Everyone take a look at the cross. That's what they made on their door. Hello? And so when the evil angel passed through to take the firstborn in Egypt... He saw the cross and the blood, and he what? He passed over. Okay? Who's covered in the blood of Jesus here? We are. 
So the enemy, who's the enemy, has to do what with you while you're covered in the blood? Pass over you. He can't touch you. It's only when you open your mouth and insert foot that he can harass you a little bit. So we want to stay out of the flesh as a Christian. Say amen. Look at somebody and say, you know, I don't care what you look like. I love you anyway. No, anyway, so I'm just kidding. So go with me. We're going to look at, at the first preparation of the lamb sacrifice on the first Passover. Can you say amen? All right, we're in Exodus chapter 12. Look at verse 1. Now, I'm only going to bring out certain parts because then we're going to go through the events of Jesus, how he fulfilled the preparation of the lamb for the sacrifice. Who's our last sacrifice? Jesus. Amen. So he's got to fulfill the requirements here. So here in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of your months. Now, folks, right here, you're going to lose me if you don't pay attention. God started a brand new calendar for the Israelites. They're leaving Egypt. It's a brand new day. So God switched from their old calendar all the way up and change it into a religious ceremonial calendar all around the birth and the death of Jesus Christ. So the Israelites didn't figure it out, but they're running on this different calendar they got from the Chaldeans, and they all set that up. It was okay, but God says, no, we're going to switch your calendar, and we're going to make the first of the month April. Or they call it Nissan. Anyone here drive a Nissan? <laughs> it's the first month of the ceremonial year of the calendar. Now, you need to know this. So God gave them a new calendar because they're leaving the world, Egypt, and they're going to go across the, the wilderness into the promised land, correct? So now what they follow is in direct fulfillment of what Jesus is going to do. So God is orchestrating their calendar around the predestined of Christ. Can you say amen? If not, say, I didn't know that. So let's see what he says. It says, it shall be the first month of this year to you. Verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house his father, a lamb for the household. And it shall be that the household is too small, then for the lamb, let him receive his neighbor and next to his house and take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall take and count it of the lamb. Okay, now let's go on. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Amen. You shall take it from the sheep and from the goats. Interesting. And a symbol of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. We're just going to stop right there. Here they're going to select a lamb. It's got to be without spot or wrinkle. It's got to be a male. Okay. And it's got to be a virgin, untouched. Can you say amen? So that it becomes a perfect sacrifice. Now, who fulfills all that? Jesus. Amen. Isn't he a male? Isn't he perfect? Amen. Isn't he called the Lamb of God? Yes. So Jesus has to fulfill all this. Now, that's not much to fulfill, but we want to show you exactly what Jesus went through. Now, I'm excited because whether you know it or not, what month are we in? Now, not the real April from way back then, because everything rotates. But if you think about it, let's pretend it's this April, okay? So on the 10th, what happens? On the 11th, what happens? You're okay. You're doing, you're doing fine. What happens on these days? And so I'm going to give you some of that, and that's what those notes are for. Okay. Certain events were pointed and taught for certain reasons, so Jesus could fulfill everything so he could die for our sins. Can you say amen? Wow, that's a lot of information. Now, I made it easy. All right, so here's a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, notice God changed their calendar to a spiritual ceremonial, ceremonial calendar, starting with the first month, Nisan, or April. 
My wife was born in April. Looks like uh, uh, Pauline was born in April. Several other April people, right? Okay. Not only that, but my wife was born on the 10th. That's when Jesus was taken. Okay, so we'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you all lined up on it. Point two, this was to coincide with the life of Christ. So God changed the Israelites' calendar to build it around the life and birth of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because the Bible says, before you and I were born, God predestined his son, predestined us to be. Can you say amen? So you already had contingency plans. He knows what kind of a knucklehead we can be. <laughs> so he's got every contingency plan you can imagine. I like to, I like to tease people. Let me, gonna, let, let me tell you something. God did not put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. That would make our father pretty dumb. He doesn't tempt anyone. Did you ever read in the Bible? It says, let no man say when he is tempted, God is tempting me. So how could God use that in the very beginning of the same yesterday, today, and forever to use that in the garden? No, Satan changed that tree and altered its DNA. That's why God says, don't eat it. Hello? God didn't say, well, don't go around it and don't eat it. And if you do, I'll forgive you. No, he says, don't get anywhere near. It's going to kill you. Now, if your folks told you that, would you listen? <laughs> Hello. And that's exactly what God says. Don't go. Don't even get near it. And who was standing by it when they got there? Snaggletooth, huh? Well, I don't want to go too far on the side journey. What we need to realize why Jesus came. Can you say amen? All right. We're going to look at the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. April 10th, the Lamb of God was chosen. Jesus headed for Jerusalem, seated on a donkey's colt. The Lamb of God was selected. That was April 10th. Okay, are you with me? So let's look at what Jesus, the Lamb of God, did from the 10th to the 16th. We're going to cover seven days. Isn't that interesting? Seven is a number of completion. Jesus is going to take seven days from the time he entered into Jerusalem to be chosen as the last sacrifice. All the way up to the 16th, seven days. Because on the 17th day, Jesus rose from the dead. Hello? Amen. So, let's look at these order of events. Number one, what happened, Brother Kerry, on the 10th? Okay, so let me kind of break it down. I, I'm not going to go into great detail. I just I have it written down for you. Number one, on the 9th, everyone say Saturday night, around 9 to 10 o'clock, Jesus sends two disciples down into Bethany to find a colt. Do you remember the story? And they said, go and tell the person that the Lord has need of it. And they bring back a coat, preparing him for the very next morning where he, they're going to put a whole bunch of stuff on the coat. And Jesus is going to get on the coat. And as it is written of him, he's going to, on the 10th of April, he's going to ride in towards Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple. This particular time was the time of the Passover, and there were more people in Jerusalem than ever before because of the, the stir Jesus has made. So I want you to let the Holy Spirit paint you a picture. So now Jesus is riding down the trail from Mount of Olives down into the, into the valley and up to the eastern gate by the, and people are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord because they're heralding him as king because the Jews thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the world and take over. They are missing the time of grace where the church is chosen. So they're thinking king, and Jesus is thinking sacrifice. Okay, so he's riding in the beginning of it, and guess what? About halfway there towards the valley as he comes out, he runs into a fig tree. And Jesus, being hungry, goes to seek fruit on the fig tree, and you know the story. He finds none. It's just got leaves on it. What you don't realize is Jesus is prophesying now 
to the nation of Israel, which is the fig tree. Now, it's a literal fig tree. Okay, it's a literal fig tree. And it didn't have any fruit. Now, I have a fig tree, and it doesn't matter. There's some kind of fruit on it year-round. Something you can eat on it. It's not tasty. <laughs> but if it has leaves, it has fruit. This one didn't have any fruit, which was a testimony against the Israelites because they were supposed to produce fruit unto God to help people find the Messiah. What were they doing? They were preaching the law and putting people under bondage. And they crucified Jesus. That's how well they were together. And you want to go back into that old covenant and wave a bunch of flags and celebrate them? No, you want to lead Jews to the Lord. You don't want a Jew to lead you to Judaism. And I've seen a whole bunch of Christians here recently. They're becoming more Jewish than they're trying to change the Jews into Christian. You have to be born again. Now, I bless them and everything like that, but so, so many Christians are so weak in their conviction, they don't know what they're supposed to believe. When somebody comes along and it's interesting, they just go for it. Good God, that's not the way we do it. The Jewish people's covenant's been fulfilled. Now it's about Jesus. Can you say amen? So if you're going to practice some of the law in the Old Testament, make sure Jesus is in the center of it. Can you say amen? I'm sort of bridging the gap between those who want to be Jewish and those who want to be Gentiles, you know. We just want to be Christian and love the Lord. Can you say amen? And, you know, there we go again. I'm going to point something out, too, you might not notice a little later on. The third thing Jesus did on the 10th was Jesus Christ's authority was challenged. They came to him, remember, he says, who says you could preach? And he says something like this, before Abraham was, I am. And you say, well, how come you're not giving scriptural reference for this? Because there's too many for you to look up. But, but you can get all of these really easy. So remember they challenged Jesus' authority. He says, who are you? You know, they challenge his authority. And he says, look, you're, even your, your King David acknowledged that I would be coming. So he was challenged in his authority. Who would want to challenge Jesus' authority, really? Satan. So he used the religious people. Folks, you're not a religious person. You love God. Religion is man trying to reach God. When Christianity, God reached man. You see the difference on that? Okay, so we're not trying to reach God. God lives in our heart now. Now we need to respond and react and build friendship with God. So the thing that Jesus' authority was challenged by the Jewish people, they begin to reject Jesus at this time. The fourth thing that Jesus covered is, you might not know it, but on the 10th, Jesus began to speak to people in parables. Before, Jesus talked plainly, but now the Jews has rejected him, and now Jesus begins to just start talking in parables. You'll find it in Matthew 13. Why? Because they had eyes but refused to see. They had ears, but they refused to hear. At any time, they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and I shall convert them, Jesus said, and I shall heal them. But meanwhile, I speak to them that are without in parables, so that they who could care less will never get it, but those that pay attention will dig for it. Do you see the difference? Those who could care less will not pay attention, but those who really want to know will dig for it. Hello. So Jesus spoke in parables. They asked him, they said, why do you speak in parables? And that's what I just said. He said, because they choose not to listen to me. They choose to listen to themselves. So to them, everything's in a parable. Hello? Say, I got it. I learned something. Okay, so Jesus began to preach in parables. Amen. And so... Also, the parables, the two parables he covers on the 10th are very interesting. Now, let me explain. How many here remember the story of Cain and Abel? What happened? Cain killed Abel. Hello, right? Same story all through the Bible. People are killing people, right? Think about it. Cain did it his way. Abel did it God's way. Your body, your flesh, how many know nothing good really dwells here in our flesh? Paul said that, Romans 7. 
He says, your body is kind of like Cain. It always wants to shut down your spirit. So don't feed your flesh too much because it's just like a beast. Hello? Come on. It's, it's just the way we are. So when Paul was confronted, he says, I want to do good, but I can't find the good that I want to do. So he said, oh, wretched man, I'm, who's going to help me? Jesus in our heart. Say, Jesus in my heart. Okay, so Jesus, these parables, all of a sudden notice they're talking about two people. First parable is about the parable of the two sons. Hello. I had a son that said he would go out and work in the field, but he didn't. Then I had another son that said, I don't want to work in the field, but then he changed his mind and went and worked in the field. Which one was blessed? The second one. Why did he pick two people? Because that's exactly what you and I are in. You're, you have two people. You have your old person and you have your new person. And your old person, if you feed it too much, it will shut down your new person. You won't want to go to church. You won't want to be around God's people. You won't want to read your Bible because that's your old person that's supposed to die away. Your new person's supposed to grow. Can you say amen? The new creation in Christ Jesus, which loves God, wants to be with God's people, wants to be around. Can you say amen? So you'll find that all the parables has to do with like two sources. There's ten virgins. Five are wise. Five are not wise. Two things, you notice. Two sons. The one did and one didn't. Then it says the wicked landlords of the vineyard. Remember, God gave the vineyard of the earth to the Jewish nation. What did the Jewish nation do with this vineyard? Folks, our history says they killed the vineyard owner. His name is Jesus. Now, Jesus is foretelling in these parables about him giving property and lands to human beings, but the human beings got disrespectful to God and began to beat all the soldiers, began all to do that, and then God showed out of a time he was not ready for him to show up, and he gave an account to all of them, and he gave each one according to their works. You'll read these parables, and it's either or, or, or either, either or. Hello. And that's how Satan works. He gets us to oppose ourselves. Galatians 5 says, says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, if you're writing it down. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, for they're contrary so that you cannot do the things that you want. So what do we do? We die to ourselves and we live unto God so God can help us fulfill our life. Smile at somebody and say, I thought you were blessed. So we find out there are six things that Jesus did. Number one, okay, he entered into Jerusalem but it would be the last sacrifice. He cursed the fig tree because it was a symbol of Israel having no fruit and nothing to give glory to God. They were just religious. Three, Jesus Christ's authority was challenged. Then he began to speak in parables. And finally, the religious questioning began. One of the weirdest questions is these religious people said to Jesus, do you pay taxes? Right out of the blue. Here's Jesus doing all this stuff. He's got a treasure and everything. And so they started, they can't find anything wrong with Jesus. So what do they do? They start picking on and paying taxes. That would be like saying, hey, have you talked to the IRS lately? <laughs> Those six things Jesus did on the 10th day. On the 11th day, everyone say 11th day. There you got them listed. Number one, the Sadducees questioned Jesus about the resurrection. Now, everyone here might not know, but a Sadducee is like a Jehovah Witness. They don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe anything supernatural. They were what we call a realist. So the Sadducees were confronting Jesus saying, tell us about the resurrection. Are you going to somebody get married? Are they going to be married to the brother? And it goes through all of these challenges. And Jesus says, you do error not knowing the scripture. So the Sadducees, I, have, I love this. The Sadducees did not believe in, in angels or the supernatural. That's why they were sad, you see. 
And then on the other hand, Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees. They were the ones that added all the extra little things with the law. He says, not only do you need to be circumcised, but you got to be circumcised by Gamaliel, the circumcised king. Amen. Dr. Snip. <laughs> Moving right along. So on the 11th, they started questioning him. Then they were done. They couldn't, he, they couldn't trick him. So now the Pharisees started questioning him. You know what they questioned him about? Loving the law. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus, in the law? Jesus said to love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as I have loved you. New Testament, I have loved you. Old Testament, as you love others. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who don't love themselves. How could they love anyone else? So we have Jesus in us. He's a lover, so we can love others with God's love. Say amen. And so they were done questioning. So Jesus now is questioned about his ancestor tree. Again, where'd you come from, Jesus? What are you doing, Jesus? Before Abraham was, I was, I am. So he's confronting all of these people who are speaking on behalf of the devil and the religion. Okay, and then he says, then Jesus pronounces woes on the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Have you ever got a chance? One, woe unto you, Sadducees and Pharisees. You are whited sepulchers full of dead man's bones. Let me explain. You look pretty on the outside, but inwardly you hate people and you call people names and you're angry and you're unforgiving. Hello. So we can look pretty on the outside, but we can be full of dead man's bones and everyone say, not me. So Jesus really starts to pick on them. And he says, look, he pronounces a woe, woe, woe. Pharisees, you do add to the law. You do put heavy burdens onto people. You don't even follow them yourself, he said. So you can see Jesus is confronting all of this opposition. Remember what I told you a long time ago. If Satan can't come to you personally, he'll send someone. <laughs> Hello? He'll send your friend, your relative, somebody will bring up something because he can't come to you and threaten you personally. So he'll send someone. Pharisees, Sadducees, these religious people coming against Jesus. These religious people coming against Jesus. Who, were, who was motivating them? Satan, the God of this world. Now remember, when Jesus came and he died and rose again, he stripped Satan. So he's no longer the God of this world. He still thinks he is. But he's no longer. So you can go. I, I was just watching some Cambodian temples and Indian temples and over in Thailand. I mean, Angkor Wat. My goodness. Now you're looking at something that was built by demons, not people. They didn't have copper chisels and chisel all that stone. No, these things are made by the fallen ones and their Nephilim and all these good. They made all of these great. And then they made the people worship them. I don't know, India has over three million gods. Now, I'm not putting anything down. That's man's effort to really want to know God. But if you were the devil, I would utilize that. You want to know God? Just follow me. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no. And that's what he did to the world all the way up to Jesus' time. Even one time, God had to destroy the world, didn't he? Noah's flood. So, finally, Jesus teaches on giving. What was the first lesson that Jesus taught on giving? Do you know? Remember the widow with the two mites? Yeah. He taught on the basis of giving the condition of our heart. Right? We give because it's in our heart to give. But the world tries to get us to keep. But he points out to this woman. He's teaching his disciples that giving comes from the heart not the amount of money you make. Amen. Come on. Some people can give a house. Some people can give only $2. It doesn't matter the amount or the level that you're in. It matters that you're faithful in your giving. So he used the widow with the two mites and said she's given more than everyone else. Now, what happened on the 12th day, Pastor Kerry? On the 12th day, Jesus teaches on the signs of the times. You see this temple? 
in 70 AD, you won't see one stone left upon it. And then he begins to say, men will come in my, and then he says, it will be like birth pangs. And he gives a discourse on the end time that we're in right now. Can you say amen? He did this on the 12th. Then Jesus began to teach parables about the ten virgins. What's the ten virgins about? It's about the coming of the Lord. Five ready, five not ready. Just to keep it simple. Okay? And then he began to teach the parable of the separation of the sheep from the goats. Ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Huh? One against the other. Huh? And then he teaches on the sheep from the goats. Everyone say sheep and goats. Back in the day of, of Jesus, both were in the pen. Sheep and goats. Can you say amen? But goats have a different personality than sheep. Sheep follow goats sort of but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. I know Jesus meant, but yeah, but. So the idea behind that is, is, is that in the last days, God is calling his faithful to come pray to be with him. Say amen, faithful. But the goats are going to continually do their own thing, go to church when they want. They're going to read their Bible when they want to sort of just be religious. Now, I'm not putting anyone down. I'm just telling you, because goats always do their own thing. Hello? When Jesus used that illustration to tell us, stop doing your own thing, start learning to follow Jesus, because he's the only one that's going to get us out of here. Can you say amen? And we're right at the time where God could just come right now and take us home. So I'm a pre-rapture person. Why? Because I know my Heavenly Father. How many here are fathers? Would you send your son to live with the Antichrist for seven years? I mean, that's just mad. That's how Satan has worked into the church. They get all the end time stuff all messed up. They conglomerate it together, and then they spin it like a yin and yang and hope it all comes together. No, 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 no. Know the difference between what is good and what is not. Every perfect gift, every excellent gift, everything that's perfect and good comes from God. Everything else that's not so perfect and good comes from a few other sources. Pinch yourself and say, hey, it could be me. It's not what you hear, it's what you want. Yeah, look out, Sherry. Yeah. <laughs> That's our little uh, it's baseball season, you know. All right. So now we found out what he did on the 12th. Then the Jews got together and said, we've got to kill this man. So on the 12th, the Jews, high priest got together and they plotted to kill Jesus. Say, I didn't know he covered all that stuff. Yep, yeah, now we move it to the 13th day. Here we go, the 13th. Jesus is anointed because of his burial. Remember the woman who came in with the alabaster box and she anointed Jesus' feet with a, and, wi and wiped it with her hair? That was Mary. She was a prostitute. Of course, the religion people said, Ew. and Jesus said, oh, no, she's doing it for my burial. Isn't that an honor? What an honor. You see, God doesn't look of where we've been. He looks at his children want to be with him forever. Say amen. All right. So then she came and anointed him for his burial. Okay. And then to Judas, remember Judas Iscariot? He agrees to betray him for 30 pieces of silver on the 13th. On the 13th, the Gentiles begin to speak to Jesus when before they were treated distantly. It says, and the Greeks began to talk to Jesus. Do you know why that happened? Because the Jews rejected Jesus, so Jesus left the house of Israel and went to the sea of the Gentiles. And you see him from then on preaching to everyone. Hello. It was to the Jew first and then to the Greek, right? But now it's to everyone. He says in John 10, I have another flock that's not of this fold. The other flock is the Gentile believers. It's not the Mormons. <laughs> Can you say amen? The other flock is you had Jews back then and you had non-Jews. That's all God recognized. Jews, non-Jews. 
Hello. Now, I know I'm Scottish, and I know some of you are other different backgrounds, but God recognizes only the Jews and non-Jews. Now, God has broken down that middle wall, and now he's treated as one. There's neither Jew, nor Gentile, bond, nor free, male, nor free will. We're all what? One in Christ Jesus. So, guess what? I'm your brother. Oh, my God. <laughs> Help him, Lord. Okay. Let's move on past that. So on the 13th, okay, the Gentiles begin to talk to Jesus, and the Jews reject Christ one more time. Third time is it, you know. Then we move to the 14th. What happened on the 14th? Well, number one was the preparation for the Passover, the perfect place one day before the crucifixion. He sent the people out, says, go find a man. The man's got a place prepared for us to take the Passover. Can you say amen? Now, it's amazing. God changes the Passover from the Passover feast to a Lord's Supper to communion. Amen. Isn't it amazing how that happens? So, he goes on, so preparation for the Passover, okay, the perfect place. Two, Judas, the betrayer, is identified with, and at the Passover meal. And Jesus says, go do what you do quickly. Three, the institution of the Lord's Supper and communion now instead of Passover. Four, contentions over who will be the greatest. Can you imagine right there in the presence of God, Peter saying, oh no, John. I'm, I've got shotgun. No, John says, no, you don't. I'm closest to Jesus. And they were all arguing, kind of like the church today. Which church is the best? Huh? There's only one church, folks. They're just different branches of it. Amen. If this is called the first church and that's called the second church, it's still the same part of the same arm, same branch. Can you say amen? And any division God does not like. I'm not talking about false ecumenical stuff, but I'm talking about unity unto purpose, prayer, and winning souls. That's what we're supposed to be doing so we can get out of here. All right, so going on. Second of all, the centurion, okay? The contention over who is the greatest and our centurions, God begins to minister, and Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Why did he choose to wash their feet? Because they wore sandals and feet get dirty. Worst place you could really wash. And Jesus was willing to wash his feet. What was he saying? He's saying, look at guys, I love you. Have you ever had somebody wash your feet? It's very humbling. It melts your heart. It melts. I had a guy who was real mad at me one time. And so I asked my friends, I said, get me a, a tub, some soap, and water. I'm going to fix them. So I said, look, I'm going to wash your feet. You're not going to wash my feet. I'm going to wash your feet. See those two big guys right there? They're going to help me wash your feet. And he started to cry. He says, I was so mad at you. And I started to wash his feet and crying and stuff. God has a healing power if we'll just open our heart. Can you say amen? Don't look at the differences between everybody. Look at our united togetherness. We love the same Lord. Can you say amen? Now, we're not talking about weird religions. We're talking about loving Jesus Christ. Amen. So he goes on further. And Peter's denial. On the 14th day, Peter denied the Lord how many times? Three times. He also, Jesus had a farewell prayer. Remember in John 15? I, I said it wrong. Farewell prayer. John 15, he talks about the vine and the branches, sings a hymn with them, washes their feet, and then goes out, prays a prayer, and says farewell. Then they follow him to the garden. Can you say amen? And Jesus promises his coming of the Holy Spirit. Look at guys, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. Then Jesus teaches on the abiding of the vine. Then he teaches his disciples that when you are following me and after I'm gone, you know what's going to happen to you guys? What, Jesus? You're going to get persecuted. People are going to come against you. They're going to come against you because of me. Because you are spoiling their corrupt life by being in love with God. Now, you didn't 
preach at them, you didn't do anything but live a full, happy life. But to them, how dare you be happy when I'm so miserable? So we'll go on past that. Okay, Jesus teaches on abiding the vine. Jesus teaches his disciples about persecution. Jesus prays as his disciples in the garden slept. You guys pray with me one hour, right? What were they doing? Not once, but how many? Three. Yeah, and it is a sleep on now, for the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And then he moves on to the 15th. Everyone say 15th. This is crucifixion day. Jesus is tried, condemned, and mocked, and beaten. I don't want to go into too much detail because there's a really neat... Uh, film strip that shows the beatings of Jesus and actually the tearing of the flesh and stuff. I didn't want to ha have you be exposed to that. I mean, you don't need to. You can see that in your imaginations. But Jesus looked like hamburger. You take a pound of hamburger and slap it on a cross. That's what he looked like. You couldn't tell his face. You couldn't tell anything other than he's upright. And we just think Jesus there had a little garment on and everything is great. We, we don't understand that he went through all of that for us. And then he went to hell. Hello? A lot of people don't think Jesus went to hell. Yeah, he went to hell. He had to take back a couple of things. Can anybody tell me what the devil had a hold of that Jesus had to take back? The keys of hell and death and the earth. Folks, you don't know that when Jesus came the first time, this earth was a prison. No one left the earth. That's why Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. He's the first one that broke Satan's curse that Adam gave this planet to him. And Jesus went down there, and here's another fallacy. Jesus didn't go down to hell to punch the devil out. He just walked right across and took the keys. Satan was already whipped. And see, that's what Christians don't know. When you speak Jesus, Satan runs in terror. But when you threaten the devil, listen to me, when you threaten the devil in your own power, he laughs at you. So you could be yelling, I rebuke the devil, and you just get hoarse. But you can whisper, I release Jesus, and he'll run in terror. Because the anointing comes from the core of your being, not the intellect of your head. Say amen, someone. Not here, here. Not here, here. If I got God in here, he's too small to help my problems. <laughs> amen. In here, let him expand you. Make you big and strong. Say amen. So here's what happened. Crucifixion day, Jesus was condemned. Peter denies him three times. Jesus was condemned by the Sanhedrin. And Judas had remorse and committed suicide on that day. Jesus goes before Pontius Pilate the first time. He washes his hands, sends him to Herod. Jesus goes before Herod Antipas, which was crazier than a loony bin. Look up the history. Most of those were crazy. Jesus goes before Pilate the second time and releases Barabbas. The conclusion of the trial, the mocking, the final condemnation of Christ happens. Jesus walked from, Gal walked from Jerusalem on the way of suffering to Golgotha. Now, folks, you might not know this, but Golgotha was a place that Jeremiah the prophet had purchased years ago. And he didn't know why he purchased it. It was a big, dumpy place. It was Golgotha. Folks, because when the last sacrifice is given, the blood has to run down on the top of the altar of the Ark of the Covenant, where the cherubim are, to on the mercy seat. Now, why would God not have the Ark of the Covenant underneath in Jeremiah's property he bought, hide it there, so when Jesus was crucified, his blood went right down onto the gravel and dripped down over the mercy seat once and final for our salvation. Then God, I'm going to tell you, went right on in and removed the Ark of the Covenant because people worship things instead of the one who makes them. 
And that's why they can't find no Ark of the Covenant, because God took it. They got the same thing. Satan wanted the body of Moses, didn't he? Why would he want the body of Moses? So he could make a shrine out of it. Because Satan feeds on false worship. So he'll take somebody who loves God and make him religious. And the religious person will feed the devil and give the devil power over them. And that person will wear themselves out by the end of their life. You think that's God's plan for us? I've seen people work hard all their life and then they retire and only live for a couple of years. What? No way. Say amen. No way. Now it's time to live. Glory to God. All right, I'm finishing with you. So Jesus was placed on the cross from 9 a.m. till noon. Now, you might not know this, but from noon till 3, it was so dark you couldn't see the nose on your face. So from 9 to noon, Jesus was on the cross. Everybody was gathered to see what he was doing. They were parting lots for his garments. They were doing all of this. And then at noon, suddenly an earthquake. And it got real dark. Now, this is not the earthquake that opens the tomb. This is the earthquake that gets everybody's attention. And that's where the two, the two soldiers go, truly, this must be the Son of God. Remember all that? Remember, this is all happening in a couple of days. So the reason why I'm sharing like this today is so that you'll go back and look at those incidents and find out the intermingling of Jesus with the people. And the richness that he did, everything was a teaching lesson. Everything was getting people ready for his death and resurrection. Are you still with me? So, in the second set of three hours, it was completely pitch dark. And then they could hear Jesus sing, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Do you know what he, why he said that? Let me ask you this. This is just a knowledge. Can God die? So Jesus had to give back the God part to God so he could die as a man. Man for man. The man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. So he went as a man into hell took the keys of death and hell and then went over to Abraham's bosom. Remember that little compartment I told you about? It says, look, boys, we're going to be leaving here in about a day. Get ready. Hello. And so Jesus went into hell, preached to the spirits, told the evil spirits, your, your time is over. Satan, you have but a short time. And guys, I'm going to be leaving this time tomorrow. Can you imagine that? I put it in more modern words. There was no decking the devil. There was no kicking him, spitting on him or anything. Jesus just simply went, snatch. He says, you're done. How come Christians don't fight the devil that way? We rebuke him and then we wait to see if he's gone. <laughs> Hello? I'm just edging you a bit, okay? All right, I'm finishing. So what happened on the 16th, Pastor Kerry? Jesus' tomb was sealed, guarded, and the disciples, in case they would steal him away. They were afraid, hiding in a house. Jesus left his body, went into hell, dealt with the devil, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Then thirdly, there was no fighting. The devil was just completely annihilated, and Jesus commanded the devil, hand over the keys. So that's why we spend our time being with God so that we have all that he's promised us and we're not being religious about what we think is God. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a praise? Amen.